I've been basically where we left off last week. We began to look at the opposing side, the folks that were, um, they were just generally against it, you know. Uh, I heard about a man who went to a church once and uh, sat on the back row and the preacher preached for 45 minutes and at the end of the service somebody asked this man, well, did, did you hear what the preacher said today? He said, well, he preached about sin. And, and what did he say about it? Well, he was against it. 45 minutes, that's all he got. Well, sometimes that's all you, you need to be is just against it. Well, we're going to find out this morning that opposition always comes. If you're doing something worthwhile for God, if you're doing something that is uh, out there on the edge of your comfort zone, I can guarantee you that opposition will come. And the reason is because when your will begins to move in line with the will of God, when your will starts to move on that direction towards what God wants for your life, you can be certain that you are going to come in some kind of opposition with somebody else's will. Because your will following God, their will following self, you can't help but find some opposition. Anybody that follows God, anybody that follows the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come into opposition with other folks because there can only be, at the end of the day, there can only be one master in your heart. Some people are going to let money master them. Some people are going to let other folks master them. Some people are going to let our society or culture or whatever other thing might master them. But then there's that few that say, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to do the thing God created me to do. I'm going to move in that direction. And when you do, you will face opposition. That's just a given. I can tell you that. I can promise you that based on the Word of God. And I want to begin in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, looking at that. Now, if you know what has just happened as we've been studying through here, Nehemiah has just made his uh, trip down from the, the king. The king has granted his request that he's going to... Uh, go seek the welfare of, of, of Judah and of Jerusalem. And now in verse 10, it starts off with the opposition. Nehemiah had to expect this, but look at how it actually reads. Verse 10, And when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. The enemies at this point, had only heard of Nehemiah's plan. They didn't know what Nehemiah really had in mind. They didn't know how far it might go. But they were displeased. They were disturbed. Now, somebody else's translation may have a, a little bit more emotional sounding word. I looked it up in the German Bible, and it's very emotional there. It says, it vexed them sorely. And when you vex somebody sorely in German, it's bad. In fact, I can't even pronounce it. It all sounds like you're, you're saying ugly words. That was bad, okay? Whatever that is, is bad, okay? They didn't like it that somebody would come to Judah to seek the good of the, the, the Israelite or the Israeli people. At that time, they didn't have that name. But for them to come there, that really upset Sanballat and Tobiah. And so they began to sound the alarm, but they really didn't do all that much. The people in Israel, though, they saw the displeasure. The folks that were down there in Judah and around the city of Jerusalem, they knew who the local big shots were. And one of the things you know about big shots is you want to keep the big shot happy. Now, you may not know who the big shot is in your area, but whoever the other folks are afraid of, that's the big shot. And they want to keep them happy. And so uh, here they were. They were kind of ruined. San Ballot Tobiah, they kind of had their fingers in every pie. They were the local, I mentioned last week, like the local, the local cattle baron from the old Western show. Or maybe they were the, the Corleone family from one of the other movies that uh, we're not supposed to watch. But, you know, they were the mob boss, all right? And you've got to keep the mob boss happy because all he has to do is give you the eyebrow. And you know somebody's going to jump up and get busy taking care of making the mob boss happy. All you have to do is ruffle the feathers, disturb the status quo, and you make them unhappy. And friend, let me tell you something. As I mentioned last week, those guardians of the status quo, they count on that reputation. They have that, uh, it's kind of like the bully mentality. I don't know if you've ever had to deal with any bullies, but I've, in my lifetime, we probably all have. But those bullies, they really count on that exaggerated opinion that people have of them. That all you had to do one time was win a fight one time, and after that, everybody, watch out for him. He'll beat you up. He's pretty big. He's, you better not mess with him. Well, these, these bullies, they, 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 they depend on that exaggerated opinion, and they use that for manipulation. They use that to control the ones around them. 
And it may not come off as, as manipulation at first, but most of you men can identify. I hate to use this on Valentine's Day, but you know the look. Men, you know the look. Mama don't have to be all that unhappy to use the look either. All you have to do is do something she wasn't real... If she just... Okay, I'm not going to give you any examples from my life because it's none of your business. But I got the look just the other night. And all it had to be was... Yeah, Dan knows what I'm talking about. Not picking on you particularly, Dan, but... Yeah, yeah, he does. <laughs> yeah, he does. Uh, we, some of the rest of us have seen that look. <clears throat> Moving right along. We love you, Christy. Moving right along. What they may try to do, these bullies, these, these cattle barons, these local rulers, they'll give you that look, look of displeasure. Maybe it's a raised eyebrow. Maybe it's a frown. Maybe it's just something else on their face, but it's supposed to communicate volumes. And I think most of us understand it does. <laughs> Volumes of, I'm going to get you later. Now, maybe it's not that. Maybe that's, that's one way they can do it. But there are others that are more soft. They're softer bullies, you might say. And they're not the ones who come at you with the angry look or the raised eyebrow or the pursed lips. No, no. They're the ones that come to you and their, their bottom lip starts to quiver. And they just can't believe you hurt their feelings so bad. You know the ones I'm talking about, Brother Preston. They get that bottom lip just, I mean, it's going. And all of a sudden, it's, oh, baby, what did I do? I'm so sorry. What can I do? How can I fix this? I, I just didn't mean to hurt your feelings. And that's what they want you to do. Because if they can get you going their way, they win. And there are a lot of soft bullies out there that are winning arguments based on something as simple as that because you disappointed them. Because you hurt their little feelings. How could you be so insensitive and cruel? <laughs> Now, I've never done that in my life. <clears throat> but I know how. <laughs> Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's the fact that they're so important to this organization that you're in, the business, the community organization, the church, the family, that if you don't get them on board, what you want to have happening won't happen. You know, that I've heard that phrase, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You probably better get mama on board before, I, before you try to do anything else. Now, men, it's not a good place right there to be nodding your head, okay? But just understand, inside, we're nodding. But now, we all know people who say, if I don't support this, it won't happen. If you don't make me happy, I'll leave. And if I leave, this thing won't happen. Now, granted, I'm reading a little bit maybe into this the word displeased, the Tobiah and, 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 and Sanballat. But all of us have experienced this kind of soft opposition. And if they can stop you with just that, they'll stop right there. They may not really yet actively try to oppose you, but if they can give you that eyebrow, they can give you that quivering lip, if they can give you that look of displeasure and stop you, they win. They're fine. Because what they're doing is they're communicating their veto. And many of us stop right there. Many things I mentioned last week in God's kingdom are still born because many of God's people lose right there at that stage. I never thought I'd make somebody unhappy. I mean, after I became a Christian, I was going to be nice to everybody. Everybody's going to be nice to me. I started to, started to follow Jesus and we're all going to get along, right, Brother Jeff? Never going to have any opposition. Never going to have anybody look at me. I just, I just, and, and you know what? A lot of God's people stop right there. All they have to do, see that little, da little dab of displeasure, that least little bit of resistance. Well, it couldn't be God's will for me to have to be displeasing to somebody, so I better just stop right there. And let me guarantee you this, the devil and his disciples love it when we stop. Because if that's all they have to do, they don't have to waste a lot of, of, uh, of attention and, and con concern on us, but they can stop God's plan. Stillborn in the stage of, you know, I'm just thinking about, no. Oh, okay, better not do that. By the way, let me tell you one other thing about this. The enemy really doesn't worry too much about what we say. Now hear me carefully. The enemy doesn't really worry too much about our big talk. You know, when we stand up and we start having meetings and we're going to get on the stick and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to have all these plans. and we The enemy doesn't really care about our big talk. 
He's not worried. He's not really distressed until we actually begin to pull that trigger. You see, the enemy doesn't care how much we talk and rearrange the chairs and redecorate the church building as long as all we're doing is spinning our wheels and staying in one place. Until we actually get up off of our blessed assurance and go out and get busy doing something, and that gets their attention. As long as we have this uh, this mentality of, well, I'm concerned. I mean, that's what Nehemiah could have done. When he heard about the walls of Jerusalem and the gates of Jerusalem, he could have stayed in Susa and said, you know, that's terrible. Maybe I'll write a check. Maybe we need to organize a letter-writing campaign and encourage those people down there. He could have done that. He could have felt really a lot better about himself for doing it. And many of their disciples are still alive in churches all over the country today. But now Nehemiah got up and he went and did something. And it displeased Tobiah. It displeased Sanballat. Nehemiah actually could have stayed there in, in, in Persia and then never have benefited God's people. So they tried the first step of manipulation, uh, of bullying. They were displeased. Okay. They let it get out that, you know, for folks that, hey, I'm upset about this. And if the enemy and, and his followers can stop you with that, that look or with the hurt feelings, they don't care how long they have to do it, they'll do it. And by the way, <clears throat> ooh, I'm going to get into deep water right here, Brother Gary. The world and the flesh and the devil, they know how to use that kind of soft manipulation, but there's also some weaker brothers who know how to use it too. Because there are carnal Christians all around us who will see you suddenly getting on fire for reading your Bible. They'll see you suddenly getting on fire for missions. They'll see you suddenly getting on fire for youth. And you're ready to go do something for God. And they're going to be right there to say, well, you know, brother, you better be careful. You'll hurt somebody's feelings. And these carnal Christians are right there to tell you how it can't be done. How could, how could you say we need to go evangelize the Muslims? Don't you know that they have, they're, they're sincere and everybody that's sincere is going to heaven, right? What? But yet, there's a whole crowd of people that want to stop other Christians from becoming excited or at least getting on the stick for Jesus because don't be judgmental, brother. Don't call sin, sin. Don't be hurtful. Don't be so condemning. I mean, after all, our gay brothers and sisters need love too. Yeah, they do. They need to be loved out of that lifestyle back to Jesus. Amen. It's amazing to me how many... <clears throat> it's amazing to me how many heathens and how many carnal Christians will suddenly know exactly how you're supposed to act. Well, aren't Christians supposed to love everybody? <laughs> and they always say it just about like that. And I think... You know, I never heard that before. Can you show me? I've got my Bible. Can you look that up and show me where that is? Well, it's in there. Because Christians are supposed to... It's amazing how they suddenly become experts at how I'm supposed to act whenever I'm displeasing them. Gives me the galloping trots. That they think that they... Well, anyway, moving right along. That's number one. They will attempt to stop you with displeasure. If they can't do that, they'll move on to the second one. That's they'll begin to voice the opposition. Skipping down a ways to chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. They begin to voice their opposition. Couldn't stop Nehemiah with just their displeasure. So here come the voices of opposition. Verse 19. Verse 18 is when he, they had talked to the people and they said, let's arise and build. The people said, let's get busy with it. They put their hands to the good work. Then verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite... And Tobiah the Ammonite official, and now Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. They couldn't stop Nehemiah with just displeasure, so they began trying the mocking tactic. And by the way, we're going to hear some of that coming up in the next election cycle as we continue towards the election. There'll be a lot of mocking of Christians and Christian opinion. They wanted to stop Nehemiah. So basically, I can just almost hear Tobiah saying, So, you're building a wall and you're letting women and children and farmers build your wall. Good luck with that. You ever hear mocking like that? 
Somebody says, look, we're going to build a great church and God's going to move through these people right here and they're not seminary professors. We're just folks. We're farmers and we're shopkeepers and we're, we're truck drivers and God's going to use us to change our world. <laughs> Good luck with that. See, the enemy will stop you with mocking if he can. And if you start to question his plan, God's plan that is, you might stop. Well, they didn't stop with mocking, so they tried despising. Look at that word there again in verse 19. They, they mocked us and then they despised us. Now, most of us have, have at least heard of despising. Some of us have been despised. I can just hear them again. Maybe it was the, maybe this one was Sand Ballot saying, don't you appreciate how we've protected you. I, hear, hear, I can almost hear the, 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 the Godfather again. Don't you know how we've protected you? How many times we've kept people from sweeping in here? You just, just don't understand how we've taken care of you. We've protected you. We've been your, your, your protection all this time. Well, they despise the people of God. And if despising won't work, they'll try slander. And that's what he did next. What is this thing you're trying to do? And then the next thing, are you trying to rebel against the king? Come up close, I want to tell you a secret. Sanballat and Tobiah did not know that Brother Nehemiah was King Artaxerxes' homeboy. They didn't know that Nehemiah and King Artaxerxes had grown up together, that they were, that they were so close, that God had moved to give them that relationship. And so when they came in, they said, So, you're rebelling against the king, are you? Boy, if you said that in ancient times... That was just like a red alert going off. Hey, they're rebelling. And everybody around would say, okay, we don't want to be around that because the king has a way of cutting people's heads off when they rebel. And that's what the accusation was. They said, we can see what you're doing. You're trying to set yourself up a little duchy of your own. You want to have the, the be the king Nehemiah, don't you? Of course, Nehemiah had no such intention. He'd already promised the king, I'm going to be down there while I'm going to come back. But they tried with slander, and then they tried pollution. They wanted to get in and help too. That doesn't read this, it doesn't say this out loud, but we know from this time before this and even after this that Tobiah the Ammonite particularly, he was always trying to get his way in there. He even married into one of the priestly families we're going to find out later on. But he was always trying to get in there and help. So they basically said, hey, we'll just help you build the wall. We'll come be a part of this. We'll know where all the weak spots are, and we'll help you out with that. And Nehemiah said, oh, no. In fact, I love how he said it there in the end of verse number 20. We, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. Basically, he said, there's the door. Don't let it hit you on the way out. We're going to do this on our own. Now, skip down to verse 4, verse number 1. They're still trying. These are still the voices of opposition. We'll go back and work on chapter 3 another time. But right now, verse number 1 of chapter 4. Now, it came about that when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, the work has already started, we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. And he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the armies of Samaria, the wealthy men of Samaria, and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was near him and said, Even what they're building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. See, they tried accusation. They tried threatening. They tried bullying. And now they've tried insults. And I can, this one, is, this is so down home. This is so country. I can just hear them. I see that wall you're building. I hope you're not going to plant to keep any chickens behind it because the first fox that comes is going to knock down your wall and get your chickens. So be careful with your chickens because you Jews, you don't know how to build. I mean, slander, accusation, everything they could to try to knock them down. And I think if you bring that into 21st century America, you can see how that really would play out in our nation. See, our enemy tries to manipulate and intimidate us into subjection. They want you to give up your dream. They want you to step back and not push into their domain. They want you to give up. And they start off by questioning our motives. You'll hear somebody this election cycle say, well, stop trying to ram your religion down our throat. You know, I'm 52 years old. I've never seen anybody get my religion rammed down their throat. I don't even know what that means, except that they think it's bad. 
And they want to stop us doing it. They want to say we're trying to raise up some kind of a, a, an American, uh, 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 what do they call that? A, a theocracy. Yes, that's the word. That somehow we're going to force them to become Christian. We're going to force them to be our form of Christian. And they, they, they throw that slander at us all the time. And so they want us to shut up. They want us to back up. They say, keep your religion inside your little stained glass ghetto which they want to become a stained glass prison and keep all of your opinions in there. And if you come out here, you've got to do it our way. They start that way. They move on to ridiculing. You Christians, you just don't understand. I mean, society has moved on. We don't live in the 20th century anymore. We don't live in the 19th century. That antiquated book you're reading, do you guys really seriously take that as, as the truth? I mean, come on. It was written... Thousands of years ago, we've moved on. We're far more progressive these days. By the way, progressive, that's a code word for throwing out the old morality. Progress, in fact, they want to talk about the new morality. New morality is simply the old immorality with a fresh coat of paint. They move on to mocking us, making us all guilty. Have you ever heard of somebody who has, maybe their church has had a fall or there's a, a, a ministry that everybody knows and maybe the minister falls? That day, every other Christian in the country is guilty of what that guy did. Well, you Christians, you're all just like so-and-so. And I could drop two or three names and you'd know exactly what I'm talking about. Or if that, the, 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 the scandal in the Catholic church with the priests. A few, very, very few. But yet now every Catholic priest is suspect. And the, the world does that. They just love to do that. You're guilty of every sin ever committed by any church anywhere in history of all time. You. James, it's your fault that there was a, a, a crusade. That's what they'll tell you. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't happen to make any sense. They just want to shut you up, shut you down, and back you up. So they move on to threats. And this is where they said, are you trying to raise up a kingdom for yourself? Well, in our day, you know what they say? We'll write a letter to the ACLU. You know, the American, the anti-Christian union. That's, they say, we'll file suit against you. We'll shut you down. We'll back you up. We'll come against you with all kinds of harsh words. And we'll say you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny. See, they threaten to report them to the king. We are constantly hearing that same thing. We're going to take you to court and we are, we're watching. You can look back over the last 60 years and see one right, one freedom, one, uh, Thing that the God gave us and the Constitution guaranteed washed away one at a time, all down through the last 50 or 60 years in our country. And now they want to take away even more. And what's happened is as our rights have gone down, the special rights of those supposed minorities have gone up. And you wonder, why are they more special than we are? I mean, we all had the rights to begin with, but now only they do. Give me a physical break. But now, listen, listen. When the enemy... <laughs> When the enemy begins to accuse you, Brother Derek, you're in good company. Because you know what the Scripture says? The devil is the what? The accuser of the brethren. So if you're being accused of something, that probably means you're one of the brethren. I'm right up there with the Apostle Paul. <laughs> well, okay, maybe just Peter and John. But you know, I'm in tall cotton now because I'm being accused. He's the accuser of the brethren. In fact, I heard Adrian Rogers one time say, Opposition always comes. And the only reason for opposition not to come is, see, if you never meet the devil in battle, it's because you're traveling the same way as he is. If you never come against the enemy, that's because you're walking along with the enemy. I don't want to be a fellow traveler with him. Either that or we're just not getting much done for Christ. There's a couple of possibilities. But I don't want to be a traveling companion with my enemy. I want to be living that dream that God has given us as a congregation. See, we have two commands, basically, as you boil them down. We have that command to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we have that second command of loving our neighbor as ourself. And friend, my dream, my, my vision for our church, for this whole area, to see us rise up as a, as a community that is reaching up with a passion for God in worship and in obedience and in crying out and, and just lifting up Jesus so that all men will be drawn to Him, reaching up with a passion for God and then and then reaching out with a passion for people. 
Loving God and loving people. You put those together, you've got true and pure religion. And friend, that's our dream as a church. That's the dream that God had when He founded this church 35 years ago. But when you do, you have a God-sized dream and you're looking for God-sized results, you can be absolutely certain that you're going to face opposition. And the Bible tells us to count it all joy. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you enter into various trials and tribulations, knowing that the trying of your faith bringeth forth patience. Nehemiah was under attack verbally. He was under attack with the eyebrow and the quivering lip. And so what did he do? Look at the next verse in chapter 4. We're nearly done. He was under attack. He was being opposed. And so what did he do? Did he tuck his tail and run back to Persia? No, he immediately went to God. Look at verse 4. Hear, O our God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and let their sin be blotted. Whoa, he's pretty tough on them. Let not their sin be blotted out before thee, for they have demoralized the builders. You know what he did? He kept on working and he kept on praying. And friend, that's what we need to do today. If we see a society around us getting darker by the day, we need to keep on working and keep on praying. Amen. Go back to the one who had the idea to start with. It was God that sent Nehemiah down here to do this. He kept right on reaching out with a passion for people because he knew those people needed a wall. He kept right on reaching up with a passion for God because he knew he had God's plan in his heart. See, if they can't stop you with displeasure... Your enemy will come against you with slander, opposition, voices, bitter accusations, ridicule, slander, whatever they need to say. But friend, let me hear, let me, let me say to you, don't give up the dream. Don't ever give up on that dream. I mean, listen, it's one of those things where you finally worked up the, the courage to go ahead and take that step of faith and you, sometimes trembling, you went ahead and took that step of faith. Your enemy knows right then you're at your most vulnerable. And so he's going to hit you as hard as he possibly can. He wants to stop you right there. You finally worked up the courage. You finally stepped out on faith. You finally pulled the trigger. In that moment, I want you to remember the eagle. Now, most of you have heard how eagles work, how eagles fly. When an eagle sees a storm coming, you know, a lot of birds, they see a storm coming, they get to the ground. They want to get underneath that. They want to hide. They want to get under in a tree or they want to get up in a, a crag of a rock or something, but not an eagle. An eagle sees opposition coming. An eagle sees a storm coming. An eagle sees those thunderheads building. And you know what he does? He flies right into the storm because he knows he's got something from the Lord where he can lock his wings and he can catch one of those thermals as that air starts to rise in front of that storm. And he can rise and rise and rise and rise. And the same wind that was going to destroy others is going to cause him to rise even higher. That same storm the enemy means to drive you into the dirt, God can use it to bring us even higher. Friend, remember the eagle as the opposition comes because the opposition is going to come. Some of you in this room today know that I need to accept Christ as my Savior. I've been putting it off. I've been knowing I need it. I need to repent of my sins. But I'm kind of having fun in the world. But I need to be saved. And I need to be right with God. But, but I'm just not sure I'm ready to do that, friend. I'm here to tell you. I'm, I'm begging you to pull that trigger. To cry out to God for mercy. He brought you here today so that you could make a decision for Christ whether you need to be saved or maybe you need to rededicate your life or maybe you need to join a church and get busy for Christ in a, in a family of believers. Whichever decision He might be bringing you to, I want you to know that today is your day. This is the moment when you can make that choice to follow Him the rest of your life. And when you make that choice, I, didn't, I won't try to lie to you and tell you that the world suddenly can become easy. It may become harder. But I can tell you it's worth it. Because that same opposition that comes, God will cause to raise you up higher. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, it's very simple. Because Jesus paid it all. Jesus did it all. All you must do is admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Christ died for you on that cross. 
and then confess Him as Lord and Savior. Ask Him into your heart. He'll wash your sins away. You'll be born again. This could be your birthday. It'd be easy to remember on Valentine's. That's the day I gave my heart to Jesus.